you know, Mary Oliver, uh, I forget which poem, but one of her poems, she talks about, um, you know, my work is to, to hold something close to me with all of my heart, like it's never going to go away. And then when the time comes to let it go, to let it go. Now, that's the hardest work on earth that I'm aware of. <laughs> You know, I sometimes say that I'm a Buddhist, Christian, Hindu, Sufi, you know. Uh, <laughs> you want to label me as something? Well, I got a mouthful for you, you know. <laughs> um, so I take pieces of truth from all of those that, that, are that help me in a situation that I'm in personally or the situation that I'm in collectively with the demise of our civilization and our planet. When we did the interview with Jennifer Hines, um, we ended up with uh, WASF, which can be interpreted as we are so fucked or we are so fortunate. And so I think that my most important work, and I, I, would, I would challenge everyone that this is your most important work, is to hold those two things in your heart, which I think is the hardest work in the world. Yes. Those two things in our heart. We are so fucked. We are so fortunate. Well, Carolyn, what a delight to actually have a conversation, a post-doom conversation with you. You and I, uh, about a week and a half ago, uh, co-hosted a conversation with Jennifer, and that's already up online. Mm -hmm. And... Um, and I've held you, as you know, as an older sister in this domain who really gets the challenges of our times, gets the possibility of extinction, gets the inevitability of the collapse of homo colossus and industrialism, and yet find the tools, the resources, the practices that help not just you, but you've been an enormous blessing to so many others um, who get this and go into freak out or overwhelm or grief or whatever. But before we go through some of the questions that I've been asking, uh, that we've been asking uh, other participants in this series, for those who are not already familiar with you and your work, I'm wondering if you could just take a few minutes and just help us get who you are, help us understand what you do in the world, um, um, you know, sort of who you are in the world and what you're particularly passionate about or concerned with at this time. Well, what I'm uh, particularly passionate about at this time is the predicament that we are all facing. And um, I'm a former psychotherapist and college teacher. Um, and as we'll be talking about in the interview today, um, I began to really wake up to what, what was going on in the early 2000s and then really came awake to it around 2007. Um, and so in my work with writing books and life and leadership coaching and doing workshops and teachings online, um, I'm really helping people prepare themselves and fortify themselves emotionally and spiritually. And I'll be talking about that as we progress. Yeah, that's great. Thanks. Yeah, uh, anybody listening to this or watching this, uh, please do know, as you will get throughout the course of this conversation, that Carolyn is one of the primo resources for people grappling with this and then what to do and how to stay on purpose and that sort of thing. Well, Carolyn, I want to ask um, about sort of language. Um, you know, you, we've been using the term post-doom in this series that just came to, to us in the last two months, actually in conversation or just prior to a conversation that we had up in Canada with Paul Traferka and Paul Beckwith. How do you imagine for yourself and how do you language for others uh, where we are at this time in, in culture and contracting? Sure. Well, um, in 2007, I... I saw the movie, What a Way to Go, Life at the End of Empire, which really changed everything for me in terms of helping me understand that we weren't just facing a whole bunch of different problems, but they were all connected and, and um, you know, came to one place uh, in, in the collapse of industrial civilization. And so that's the term I use for the collapse of systems. And more recently, um, I speak of climate catastrophe or climate trauma 
Um, and, and those two things travel together. They're very related. And uh, you really can't look at one without looking at the other. But most recently, I've been talking about planetary rite of passage. Um, I'm now using that consistently in my writing and teaching. Um, if people want to go to my YouTube channel, they can see my presentation that I did in March in Eugene, Oregon, in which I went into this quite specifically and in more detail. Um, because when I frame our predicament in that way as a planetary rite of passage, uh, it gives me an entirely different perspective. It's no longer about humanity as the villain or me as the victim, but rather that humanity has created for itself a tragic ordeal that it has to pass through like a rite of passage in order to be returned to the inherent wisdom that it rejected. Um, and of course, rites of passage are never fair and they're never rational or predictable. And they're, some, um, and they're sometimes even deadly. <laughs> absolutely. I mean, it was understood by indigenous people who did rites of passage that it was always a brush with death. And they knew that some of their young people who went through the initiations wouldn't survive. And yet, they believed that it was so important for the community that the young person passed through this ordeal that they were willing to take that risk. Yes, exactly. Well, uh, again, those watching or listening to this, Connie and I both watched Carolyn's presentation that she's referring to where she goes into this in some depth and Eugene, it's up on her website, uh, up on her YouTube channel. And we both loved it. Uh, Connie, I'm, I know reached out to you afterwards and was just wildly enthusiastic about that presentation. Sure. So Carolyn, as you know, the heart of this particular series is related to uh, various thought leaders, teachers, um, um, guides, therapists, counselors. I mean, all the people, the diverse, I just had a conversation with, uh, with Steve Keen, the economist uh, this morning. Um, and I'm curious, you know, I, I'd like you to take as much time as you'd like to share your story. How did you go from assuming things would be getting better and better, assuming perpetual progress? How did that shift for you? Um, and then what was that like emotionally? So both your story in terms of its outer detail, but also some in terms of its inner detail. Sure. Well, um, you know, I have to go back to my childhood. Uh, to really get the full picture. Um, I was born and raised in the buckle of the Bible Belt in northern Indiana to um, intensely uh, fundamentalist Christian parents. I was the only child. And um, I ended up going to Moody Bible Institute oh, wow. to become a missionary uh, and was kicked out of there in 1965 for being gay. Um, and then I went to a real university and got an education um, became a history major and later got my master's in history. Um, so it was a very long journey out of evangelical Christianity. And I, I noticed that today there are still, there are still some places where that issue comes up, uh, where, you know, I still see some places where I'm affected by it, but far less than I was 40 or 50 years ago. And I guess I would call myself today inter-spiritual, um, I don't, you know, I don't espouse any particular tradition, but I find truth and goodness in all of them. Um, at about the age of 40, my life fell apart and I went into Jungian therapy. And I don't mean just like once a week Jungian, Jungian therapy, but very intensely a um, couple of times a week for about 11 years. And in that process, I became a therapist. And one of the beautiful things that happened in that experience was um, I developed a deep connection very serendipitously um, with the Hopi people in Northern Arizona. And uh, that was a huge rite of passage for me. Um, and then I went on to later become a college teacher teaching history and psychology. And as I mentioned in 2007, I saw the movie, the documentary, What a Way to Go, Life at the End of Empire. And as I, as I watched that movie and processed it within myself, I was thinking, well, yeah, here's all, here are all these facts about collapse and the end of systems and the demise of civilization. And that's all well and good to have these tools intellectually to prepare for it and have the information 
but what are people going to do emotionally and spiritually? Yes. You know, I'm thinking of this as a therapist. Um, and so I wrote my first book on collapse in 2009, a Sacred Demise, Walking the Spiritual Path of Industrial Civilization's Collapse. And from there on, I just kept writing books about it. Um, I've now written seven books on collapse, and I'm consistently coaching people who are waking up and need support and direction on living with what they know. And in my life and leadership coaching, I'm not only helping people cope, but also follow what this cataclysm is calling them to do, to really help them understand that it is a rite of passage. And so what is your work? Yes, yes. Well, um, I want to amen that your book, Sacred Demise, is a gem and your others as well. Many of us in this conversation series, many other thought leaders and people who are at the front edge of this movement of post-doom or whatever we want to call it, uh, uh, reference your writings and uh, again, as I said earlier, see you as an older sister on the path, whether whether they're older or younger than you yeah. biologically. Yeah. Um, so say a little bit more, uh, if you would, about um, what have been the tools or practices specifically that you found useful and also that you share with others, but, but say a little bit more about your own emotional processing of going from perpetual progress to imminent uh, uh, contraction, collapse, um, and potential even extinction. Um, what have you, what has allowed you or supported you in waking up each day to do what you can do to make a difference where you can make a difference and not worry about the other stuff? Right. Um, well, Jung, and my Jungian therapy experience, um, I think helped me perhaps more than anything, because um, it really, you know, I learned from it that uh, life is not about perpetual progress. It's not about everything getting uh, whiter and brighter day after day. Um, but life is, you know, a whole kettle of fish, I guess you would say. Life is a, you know, a wide range of experience, and uh, much of it involves suffering. And, um, you know, if we're going to go with the light and bright, and that's all we want, we're going to have to be prepared to be kicked in the butt by darkness, and by our own shadow. And so, um, you know, Jung really kind of prepared me for, okay, the ups and downs and the descent, how important it is for me as an individual, for all individuals and for cultures to make descents into the depths. Because if we don't make a descent, we can't really discover our fullest humanity. Yes. So I did, I did learn a lot as a history major about the rise and fall of civilizations. Um, but my connection with Jung and indigenous wisdom helped me the most, I guess, in learning about the archetype and the practice of rites of passage and what purpose they serve. So now I'm beginning to understand humanity's rite of passage, and my work is about helping others understand it and supporting people not just in enduring the ordeal, but coming through it, whether alive or dead, uh, with a transformed consciousness, because that's my perspective, and that's why I believe we're here on this planet. That is the principal purpose of our human journey. And I do believe that those of us who are alive on the planet today somehow know that, and thus chose to be here at this time. For me, that's the larger story. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I, I agree with you in terms of that practically useful uh, uh, way that that inspiringly useful way of thinking about the world uh, because I'm still immersed in speaking in churches and colleges all over North America I'm painfully aware that there are many people here in America the 40% of Americans that believe that these are the end times Jesus is coming back they're ecologically clueless they're historically clueless and it's all about us um, so I, I, I'm not sure I'm willing to go quite with you in terms of we all know that but nonetheless I find that that way of thinking um, that that as Thomas Berry used to say, you know, whether it's true ontologically, that is in some fundamental ultimate sense or not, it is profoundly useful and deeply inspiring to act as if we were chosen for these times, that, that the universe in some sense chose us to be alive at these times. And um, uh, I certainly find that to be a useful uh, worldview. I, I believe beliefs aren't about truth or false. It's are they 
inspiring or not? Are they useful or not? Are they helpful or not? Um, and that's one of the most useful beliefs uh, that I hold actually is. Uh, yeah. And, and I do think that there are different levels of knowing um, that I believe on some level, everybody knows we're in climate catastrophe, that we're, we're heading 90 miles an hour toward extinction. Um, though we know that unconsciously. And so, you know, why all of this mass epidemic yeah. of anxiety and yeah. depression in our culture and suicide? Yeah. Um, because people know there's something wrong. They just don't know exactly what it is. Yeah, 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 well put. Yeah, it, it's interesting. We, I, think you're, I think I agree with you that we all have a feeling. We all sense it unconsciously or at some level in our gut, our soul, our, our bodies. And yet how we interpret can make a huge difference. So I want to I wanna have that lead into... Um, what interpretations, in addition to what you've just spoken, what other interpretations have you found that is uh, ways of thinking and feeling about our times, our history, human history, uh, within this context, do you find particularly useful or helpful? Well, I believe that humanity um, really at one time, uh, you know, we all come come with this deep inner wisdom, I believe. That is our that is our natural state. And, uh, you know, then it became called indigenous wisdom, but it's this inherent wisdom that we have as human beings. And we went on a, a savage rampage to become God, you know, we rejected that wisdom. And um, that, you know, makes some form of extinction inevitable because we just go about raping and pillaging and and completely ignoring that inner wisdom that tells us there's something more um, and that we need to do something different. Um, so we're living and creating the consequences, I believe, of that disconnection. And the real question is, are we willing to be remade as a new species through this rite of passage ordeal. It's, it's not about longevity or survival. It's about the transformation of consciousness and the rebirth of our deepest and most authentic humanity. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Well, I, your metaphor, I, I mean, I'm giving it to you. There are probably others that share it as well or use it as well, but I think it's an apt and vitally, uh, uh, timely one, this humanity going through, our species going through a rite of passage. I find that metaphor and the metaphor that I've been using in a lot of my programs, the prodigal species, you know, we've, we've, uh, we've squandered our inheritance. Um, we're waking up to our predicament, or at least some of us are waking up to our predicament, uh, and we're being forced to come home to reality. And um, I use the word, as you know, reality and God interchangeably. Reality is a secular name for primary reality, and God is a mythic name for primary reality. But ultimately, we need to live in right relationship to primary reality, um, or we suffer and ultimately um, destroy ourselves. And by primary reality, I'm including the soil, the forest, the water, the life the other species upon which we depend. Um, well, this is great, Carolyn. So uh, as you know, uh, I keep saying that because we've, we've uh, facilitated that, this process as well. But um, one of the questions that I like, I love uh, inviting guests to um, explore is how the big picture, how the universe story or epic of evolution or big green history or whatever your name for sort of the history of everyone and everything that comes through science, but when told in a mythic way, also inspires us as any creation myth can. How has that big picture, or has it, um, informed you or inspired you, or, or where do you find yourself in that? Well, I certainly relate to <clears throat> Joanna Macy's um, story, the greater story that she offers in her work, and Thomas Berry's great story. Um, it is incredibly comforting. It is incredibly inspiring um, because it presents the other side. You know, right now, all, all we're seeming to, to be able to see is the doom and gloom and the demise. Um, but, you know, the greater story shows us this is a sacred demise. There is something sacred and holy and uh, awesome, mm -hmm. in the biggest sense of the word, about what we're experiencing. This demise is sacred um, because there is this purpose of bringing us back to our deepest humanity. Um, and so, um, 
you know, it's a story of impermanence and death. You know, I don't know how many years I have left. I don't believe that death is the end of my true essence or what Jung called the self with a capital S. All life is eternal, I believe. And, and while its material form changes, the energy of that ch of form doesn't change, doesn't end. So my intention is to, in the words of Stephen Jenkinson, die wise or die wiser than I am today. <laughs> and the beautiful irony of living with death in mind every day and, and many times a day is that it, it is always attended by grief. And I want to say a lot about grief. Um, you know, as, as my awareness of the destruction of the planet deepens, of course, so does my grief. Yes. And when I allow grief to be a doorway into more grief, you know, the paradox is I experience uncanny joy and meaning and purpose and a deeper quality of love yes. than I could have ever experienced otherwise. So to die wisely is to die in wonder and awe and reverence and gratitude and beauty. To die wisely, as Jenkinson says, is to die grief-soaked and awesomely gratitude-soaked as well. Yes. 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 Well, I, I'm a full throated amen to that. Um, uh, what I'm really grateful for also is that Joanna Macy will be part of this series. So many of us see her as one of our most, if not our most significant mentors. Stephen Jenkinson just had a conversation with him the other day uh, with Barbara Cecil. Um, and this honoring, you know, recognizing that if, as Jenkinson says, you know, to awaken in our time is to awaken with a sob. And, um, and yet that grief profoundly reminds us or can profoundly remind us of our interconnectedness with all life, our dependence upon other life forms, and our deep love. We wouldn't be experiencing and feeling grief if we didn't love. Um, I, I, I want to invite you also to say a little bit more about sort of how impermanence and death have, um, you know, the sacred side of death. You've already, you already touched on it a, a little, both in terms of the Jungian, but just anything else that you want to say about um, how understanding impermanence and death is na necessary, natural, no less sacred than life. Um, I, I love the quote from Loyal Rue, the philosopher of religion. He wrote a book called Religion is Not About God. And what he means is religion is about a relationship to reality. Mm -hmm. And yes, reality has been personified or deified or an I thou relationship. But if we're not living in right relationship to reality, we're ignoring what every species has to do. And uh, he's got this uh, uh, great quote related to death. He said, death is the entrance fee play, paid on exiting. Mm -hmm. Death is the entrance fee paid on exiting. I love that one. So anything else that you'd like to say about immortality? I mean, not immortality, anything impermanence, else is impermanence yeah. um, and, and death. Um, and the fact that we, as you said, our larger self, our larger body continues long after the death. It's kind of like, I see it as kind of like the cells in my body are always dying into the process and yet I continue to live. Well, every life form is an expression of the body of life and we as individuals die and yet the body of life uh, continues. But anything else that you want to say about more? Well, yeah. Um, you know, the self, uh, the reality within, the sacred within, um, is the only permanent thing we have, in my opinion. And so impermanence, when we really get impermanence, then we're always thrown back to the self. We're always thrown back to the divine within. That's the only thing that lasts. And so when we know that, it's a little easier, not easy, but a little easier to let go, to, to release, and, and to look at, at this, you know, cinema that we're in uh, as, as something that comes and goes. And, you know, when the joy comes, man, let's just wallow in it, you know. <laughs> when, when the grief comes, let's go with it. Yes. When the, the uh, in-between comes and we're kind of bored, you know, like get into the board of whatever's happening, get into it. You know, Mary Oliver, uh, I forget which poem, but one of her poems, she talks about, um, you know, my work is to 
to hold something close to me with all of my heart, like it's never going to go away. And then when the time comes to let it go, to let it go. Now, that's the hardest work on earth that I'm aware of, <laughs> you know, is, to, is to really hold on to something, savor the hell out of it, and then let it go. Yeah. Easier said than done. Yes. And, uh, yes. You know, I, I'm not a practicing Buddhist, but I have a meditation practice that I've been doing for 40 years. Mm -hmm. And I do other spiritual practices. And um, those help me, those deepen me into my humanity, which is not a permanent state. You mm -hmm. know, it's, it comes and goes. And so the more I can release, the more I can open to the possibility of the letting go, the, the, the easier, not easy, but easier it becomes. And then grief, again, is helpful with that. Because grief is not something to be recovered from or fixed or cured. It's a doorway to the, to the very essence of our humanity. You know, and if you're looking for meaning in life, let grief take you there because that's where, that's where you're going to find it. I think that the most important skill we should be developing right now is the skill of grieving. And it yes. is a skill. But I hasten to add that, that we need to go through that doorway with support and not alone. We need to be creating small groups around us where we can come together with trusted allies on a regular basis to share all of our feelings about collapse and climate catastrophe. And, you know, wherever I go, I encourage people to create small groups like this. And um, I'd just like to mention, I don't know if they're going to be in this series, but I'd like to mention Laura Schmidt and Amy Lewis Rowe, who founded the Good Grief Network, um, which is helping people do exactly that. Yes, well, amen to everything you just said. And uh, not only did I already have a conversation with them, but unfortunately the audio file didn't well. So I've got another scheduled interview Good. with uh, Laura and Amy and I uh, highly recommend their Good Grief Network. Well, Carolyn, you mentioned a term earlier and you just referred again back to it, interspiritual. So say it just a little bit for people for whom that term is like, what? What? what's interspiritual? Yeah. Say a little bit more about that. Yeah. So spiritual for me is just a, a, a way of um, feeling connected with reality. And um, that can happen in meditation. That often happens when I'm out in nature, when I go up into the mountains here in Colorado. And I just sit and allow myself to be connected with a tree or be connected with a rock, maybe have a conversation with that being. Amen. Um, yeah. And so um, that's one way to connect with reality. There are many, many ways to connect with reality. Maybe you connect with reality through a child or through art or music or whatever. Um, but there are traditions that humans have created over the, over the millennia, you know, Buddhist tradition, Sufi tradition, Christian tradition. And uh, I'm an admirer of a lot of those different traditions, at least pieces of them, mm -hmm. that I think take me deeper into reality. Um, so, you know, I sometimes say that I'm a Buddhist, Christian, Hindu, Sufi, you know. Uh, <laughs> you want to label me as something? Well, I got a mouthful for you, you know. <laughs> um, so I take pieces of truth from all of those that... That, are that help me in the situation that I'm in personally or the situation that I'm in collectively with the demise of our civilization and our planet. Yeah, yeah. Wow, that's great. I'm glad you shared a little bit more about that because uh, when you talk about, as I also experience, uh, having a personal relationship to the various entities of the living world, the various aspects of primary reality, um, the various expressions of God, to use mythic language or religious language, I'm reminded of a quote from Thomas Berry that I often use in my evening programs. He says, we are talking only to ourselves we are not talking to the rivers. We are not listening to the wind and the climate. Yeah. Most of the disasters that are happening now are a consequence of that spiritual autism. Yeah. 
Um, it's not in any way a diss of, of autistic folk at all. It's what he's meaning. Our human centeredness keeps us from seeing and hearing the, the, the entities of the living world as subjectively intelligent vows, right. seeing the living world as teachers, not tools. Yeah. Um, so thank you for... Yeah. And speaking of, uh, speaking of t teachers, um, one of my teachers among many, many folks, one of the person I admire a lot is Mirabai Starr. And uh, she's written a number of books on interspirituality. And I remember the first workshop I attended with her, she said, have you come out as interspiritual? Um, <laughs> Come out of the closet as interesting. As well. <laughs> that's so, cute. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. That was, that's very helpful to me. Well, I, I think when you really understand language, when you understand symbolic language and understand ecology as the heart of any sustainable theology, you can't help but realize that interspirituality sort of is, is uh, the ground because all of our religious traditions, certainly those that emerged in the last 2,500 years, the axial faiths, um, lacked that deep, intimate, profound, I-thou relationship to primary reality, which is one of the reasons why we're in the mess that we are now. Yeah. And a lot of people don't understand the necessity of personification given the nature of our brains, in order to have a healthy relationship to what we depend on, we, we naturally give human characteristics to what's more than human. Uh, so Gaia isn't the spirit of the earth or the goddess of the earth. Gaia is a personification or a deification of earth, which yeah. is inescapably real. You know, the same is true for all gods and goddesses if you really understand the nature of our brains. And I love this quote from James Hillman. I uh, found this years ago. He said, loving is a way of knowing. And for love to know, it must personify. Mm -hmm. Personifying is thus the heart's mode of knowing. It's not a lesser, primitive way of apprehending, but a finer one. To enter myth, we must personify. And to personify carries us into myth. Mm -hmm. now, he's not using myth as an untrue story. He's using it the way Joseph Campbell did, a narrative that puts us in accord with the nature of reality. So. Wow. Well, well, um, Carolyn, I want to ask you about, so you've already touched on, uh, in fact, more than touched on, mentioned it a couple of times, but I want you to go lean a little bit more deeply into the gifts, what, what Paul Traferka calls finding the gift on the other side of the post-doom doorway, on the other side of grief and the stages of grief, many of us have found, most of us have found um, that sacred demise that opens us up to a, a a whole new world that we're not aware of if all we're paying attention to is what we're losing, what we're, what, what is, what is threatened to loss, but what is being gained. So say a little bit about what you find as the gift on the other side. Sure. Yeah. Um, you know, when we did the interview with Jennifer Hines, um, we ended up with uh, WASF, which can be interpreted as we are so fucked or we are so fortunate. And so I think that my most important work, and I, I, would, I would challenge everyone that this is your most important work, is to hold those two things in your heart, which I think is the hardest work in the world. Yes. Hold those two things in our heart. We are so fucked, we are so fortunate. And I believe that it's far too late for many things like stopping climate catastrophe. It's interesting. Um, <laughs> uh, a few weeks ago, um, I went downtown to Boulder to my post office box. I check my box every day. And um, I was stopped on one of the small streets, side streets in a lovely old part of Boulder, where the First Methodist Church is. And their bell is clanging, bong, bong, you know. And uh, I'm thinking, who died, you know? <laughs> And so I get up to the stoplight, which is right beside the church, and there are all these activist people out there, and they're, they, they're coming up to cars and wanting you to sign this petition for, uh, you know, doing something about climate change. And so I looked at the petition, and I looked at the woman, and I didn't want to be too uh, cynical or rude, but I said, you know, as Carol King once said, it's too late, baby, it's too late. And she looked at me kind of funny and I said, but I will sign your petition. <laughs> um, so uh, I think it's far too late for many things like stopping climate to catastrophe, but it's absolutely not too late 
to deeply adapt, as our friend Jim Bendel emphasizes in his work. For me, the only game in town is understanding that we are in a planetary rite of passage and understanding what it's trying to teach us individually and as a species. And then taking whatever action our hearts call us to take in order to mitigate the suffering. I've written three books with Andrew Harvey. And one of the things he says, as, he, as the founder of the Institute for Sacred Activism, he says, follow your heartbreak. You know, that thing that wakes yes. up at three o'clock in the morning. Maybe it's that dog out there that won't shut up. And you know why it won't shut up. It's been left out in the cold or been abused in some way. Uh, you know, or, or maybe you're just absolutely torn up by, um, you know, domestic violence and the suffering of women and children or what's going on at the border right now with people in cages. Follow the heartbreak. Let that tell you where you need to take action in the midst of this crisis. You know, my friend Richard Rohr has built a body of work over three decades around action and contemplation. And that's where I believe we all have to be focused right now. Contemplation is the work of processing what the rite of passage is trying to teach me. And action is about making a difference in my sphere of influence to alleviate suffering, to spread kindness and compassion, to create joy and beauty wherever I go, and to follow the grief that attends all that I see and all that I do. A lot of activists believe that, you know, if they feel their grief fully, they'll become incapacitated or weak or whizzy. And I believe the opposite is true. That's been my experience. Mm -hmm. When I coach activists, the first question I ask is, where's your grief? Because you cannot be a strong, powerful, vibrant activist if you haven't developed the skill of grieving. So that's where I am today. You know, it's too late for some things. It's definitely not too late for many other things. Wow. Amen, sister. Well, I, that's exactly, you just, you even covered the last question I was going to ask in terms of what do you feel is too late and what's not too late um, in a very um, uh, inspiring and prophetic way. I'm, I'm two things I want to say in response to that. Uh, one is that uh, back about eight years ago, the uh, First United Methodist Church of Boulder invited me to be the theologian in residence uh, for a couple of weeks, or maybe it was a month. And uh, so it was fun to hear you uh, share that story. The other thing that I'm thrilled to, to share with you is that I had a conversation with Richard Rohr yesterday, who's, you as did? you know, Yes. Wow. I invited him uh, to be a part of this series, and he's been such an inspiration. To I have to say, he has been one of my primary teachers over decades. So any final, any final thoughts in wrapping up this conversation? Yeah. We are so fortunate, Michael. Uh, I feel very fortunate to be able to talk to you. I feel extremely fortunate to be able to do the work that I'm doing in the world. I'm very, very grateful. Um, I get to live in Boulder. I get to live close to the mountains. Um, this is truly the best time of my life, even though it's the final time of my life. And uh, I'm just extremely grateful. And I carry grief in my heart every day. Amen. Wow. Well, Carolyn, it's a delight to co-host some of these calls with you. This, this has been a profound experience for me uh, in uh, inviting you to respond to the questions that we've been asking others as well. And um, uh, where, where do people go to find more about your work? I forgot to mention that. People should go to carolynbaker.net and they will find out about my books, my coaching, uh, and all that I'm up to. I publish and have published for 11 years, seven days a week unless I'm sick or traveling, a daily news digest. You won't find anything like it anywhere else. And at the end, it has an inspiration section, which other news digests tend not to have. That's great. That's great. All right, Carolyn. Well, uh, hope to see you the next time that we're in. Well, not hope to. I will, uh, will make sure that I will see you the next time that we come to Boulder. And I uh, look forward to further hosting some of these other calls with you. Me too. Thanks. Okay. Yeah. Uh -huh. Bye-bye.